You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Titled Prophecies That Prove the Accuracy of the Bible. Prophecies that prove the Bible. What does that mean exactly? Well, the Bible claims itself to be the written word of the one true God. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy 3, and verses 15 to 17, which reads, and that From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. See that important section there at the start there? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is a consistent message throughout the Bible that the Bible, the authors of the Bible, the men and men who wrote the Bible were inspired by God to write what God told them. And so we have a book here that claims to be written by a God. And that's a very tall claim and difficult, extremely difficult to prove. Especially as if we look through other sections of the Bible, we'll find eyewitness accounts of people raised from the dead, claims for paths to eternal life, We'll find uh, claims that God created the earth and histories and and stories that go back thousands of years. And big claims like this require big proof. And the Bible gives us the biggest proof in the form of prophecies. If we were to ask a dictionary what prophecy is, it would tell us that prophecies are predictions of what will happen in the future. They're a telling of what events that will come to pass in the future prophesied, as you will, before they happen. And there have been lots of prophets in the past that claim lots, from lots of different religions and lots of different societies to foreknow what's going to come to pass. And there's a very simple test which quickly eliminates false prophets from real prophets. It's a very simple test that you can apply. And it's two steps. All false prophecies fall into one of two categories. They're either too vague to be strictly considered prophecies. For example, you could look at the weather tomorrow on your phone and that could be considered a prophecy. But it's a little vague and it's not a real prophecy. You know, it's it's far too inaccurate and far too vague to be considered proof of inspiration. And the other uh, other common problem that many prophecies written by many people have is they're actually histories. You know, the idea that these people write events after they happen and then claim that there were prophecies spoken years before. Take, for example, Nostradamus, possibly the most famous prophet of recent events, you know, the most famous prophet of the last 500 years, say. He claimed all manner of prophecies and he was born in the 16th century, before many of the prophecies he claimed came to pass. So he passes the test of predating prophecies. However, he is too vague to be considered a real prophet. It's it's strictly speaking, his prophecies are more just general assumptions about the future. For example, this is a quote from Britannica. Nostradamus's predictions tended to be about general types of events. Some people believe his prophecies have predicted actual events regularly as time goes on. Some people believe, such as the death of Henry II, the French Revolution, the rise of Napoleon and the rise of Adolf Hitler and even the 9-11 attacks. But most historians maintain that his prophecies tend to be about general types of events that occur frequently. You know, the cyclical nature of history is such that you can make a, a rough guess about things that will come in the future from what has happened in the past. Nostradamus was a skilled author and observed patterns in history which he used to make rough predictions about the future. Uh, However, many of his correct assumptions aside, he made many, many incorrect assumptions as well. And as such, 
we have to label him a false prophet. He's not an inspired prophet, as too many of his prophecies didn't come to pass. What about the Bible then? Does the Bi- Let, let's first look at the Bible's claim to have prophecy in it. Turn with me to Amos 3, Amos 3 verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his the servants, the prophets. God will not do anything without revealing his plans for the future with his servants, the prophets. Turn with me too to 2 of Peter 1 verse 21. Sorry to jump all the way back to the other end of our Bible. 2 of Peter 1 verse 21, which reads... For the prophecies came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So these two verses tell us two things. They tell us first that God does reveal his plan in prophecies in the Bible. So God does, the Bible does claim to have prophecies from God. And the second thing it tells us is that the prophecies do come from God. They're not just prophecies written by the individual authors, not written by Paul or by Amos, for example, or by Peter. They all come through the inspiration of God. But the Bible is a book, so tonight we're going to attempt to prove a number of prophecies are genuine, bona fide, legitimate prophecies, which pre-exist the events they prophesy and took place with incredible accuracy not vague at all, to the pinpoint accuracy. And tonight, specifically, we're going to be focusing in and around prophecies in the book of Daniel. We had our reading, Daniel 2, and another prophecy in the book of Ezekiel. However, firstly, before we look at these prophecies, we we first need to establish and help the Bible to pass the first test, i.e., was the word, is the word, does the prophecies in the Bible predate the events that they claim to prophesy? Or, and also, like Nostradamus, are the prophecies in the Bible are too vague? Are, are they just rough assumptions about the future that came to pass and more or less coincidentally fell into place, but any decent historian could have a jolly good stab at it and probably come up with a similar prophecy? First, we're going to establish the age of some of these prophecies. And first things first, we can definitively say that the prophecies of Daniel and Ezekiel are at least older than 300 BC. How can we prove that? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the best proof for that. Uh, The Israel Museum in Jerusalem tells us, quote, the Dead Sea Scrolls are ancient manuscripts that were discovered between 1947 and 1956 in 11 caves near Kerbet Qumran on the northwest shores of the Dead Sea. They are approximately 2,000 years old, dating from the 3rd century BCE, end quote. This is an ancient copy of the Bible, found almost two millennia after many of the books were written. Sections of the book of Daniel and Ezekiel are found in these scrolls, and... From the condition of the scrolls and from the condition of the books, we know that these are copies. These aren't the original. So back in 300 BC, the author of the Dead Sea Scrolls was copying the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel into his Bible, implying they were at least several years before 300 BC. So we can definitively say, without a shadow of doubt, and historians all agree, that Daniel and Ezekiel predate the 3rd century BCE. And we can go back slightly further in our proof, and you'll have to bear with me, because this is a bit of a whirlwind, but it's an incredible story. The 1st century historian, Jewish historian, Josephus, tells a story in his book, Jewish Antiquities, about Alexander the Great's interaction with the Jews at Jerusalem. So, according to the translation of William Whiston, who translated Josephus' books, The story goes as such, Alexander the Great is defeating Darius III, the king of Persia, and he's reigning over the Persian armies across all of Persia, defeating them left and right. And he sends a message to the Jews at Jerusalem with some instructions. He tells them to forsake Darius 
and send auxiliaries, or soldiers and servants, food and the tribute they'd normally send to Darius to Alexander instead. However, the Jews refused this, this generous offer from Alexander as they had vowed to send the tribute to Darius instead. And if you know anything about Alexander the Great, he was very much a one-chance man. If you didn't take the chance of mercy that he gave you, the chances were you would be destroyed. And now the Jews of Jerusalem have made an enemy of the greatest tactician in all of history, known for his penchant for destroying errant and disobedient cities. To add insult to injury, the Samaritans, a rival religion in Jerusalem, had forsaken their oaths with Darius and gone straight to Alexander and sent the auxiliaries and the food and the tribute that Alexander wanted. So in exchange for this, Alexander said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll kick the Jews out and you can continue living in Jerusalem, no worries. You can worship there all you want. Alexander is furious with the Jews and, and before long, he arrives outside the gates of Jerusalem. However, before he can lay siege to Jerusalem, for some reason, the gates of Jerusalem are opened and the high priest of Jerusalem walks out. And Alexander, seeing the high priest, he worships him. And rather than destroying the city, he marches in, he offers sacrifices according to the Jewish customs and establishes protections on Jewish worship. Why did this happen? Why did Alexander change his methodology for the Jews, when we'll find out in a later prophecy that he's awfully good and enjoys sacking a city when they disobey him. Well, according to Josephus, this is the story. This is a quote from 11335 in Jewish Antiquities. However, Parmenian alone went up to him and asked him how it came to pass that when all others adored him, Alexander, he should adore, adore the high priest of the Jews. To whom he replied, I did not adore him, but that God who has honoured him with his high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream in this very habit when I was at Dion in Macedonia, who, when I was considering with myself how I might obtain the dominion of Asia, exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly pass over the sea thither for that he would conduct my army and would give me the dominion over the Persians. Whence it is that, having seen no other in that habit, and now seeing this person in it, and remembering that vision and the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that I bring this army under the divine conduct and shall therewith conquer Darius and destroy the power of the Persians, and, all, and that all things will succeed according to what is in my own mind." And when he had said this to Parmenian and had given the high priest his right hand, the priests ran along by him, and he came into the city. And when he went up into the temple, he offered sacrifice to God according to the high priest's direction, and magnificently treated both the high priests and the priests. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended. And as he was then glad, he dismissed the multitude for the present. Alexander wasn't a gullible fool. We know this from history, and we know that he didn't have a problem with destroying cities. Yet, for some reason, he didn't destroy Jerusalem, despite their backstabbing and turning against him. So it seems very likely, very possible, that Alexander the Great was shown the book of Daniel. And Alexander the Great also knew a fraud when he saw it. And he knew from reading the book of Daniel, that it wasn't written hurriedly by the high priest as, Dan as Alexander marched into the city. It had to be at least several generations before Alexander the Great. And so, we've reached a critical point in our discussion, because we've proved that the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel, from the words of Josephus, they predate Alexander the Great. And this is all we need to prove the inspiration of the Bible. Allow me to show you how. See, the book of Daniel and Ezekiel tell the rise of Alexander the Great and his defeat over the Persians and ultimately the loss of the empire he built to the Romans in incredible detail. Our reading for this evening was Daniel chapter 2 and turn with me back to that. In Daniel 2, 
we have the first great prophecy of Daniel, directed to the ruler of the first of these empires. We read about it. Daniel 2, verse 37 to 39. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. We have here the key to the first great prophecy of Daniel. Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled an empire historians call the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Neo-New Babylonian Empire. It was the second great Babylonian empire. And Nebuchadnezzar, as the story of Daniel 2 tells us, received a vision from God. And Daniel, through the power of God, interpreted it. So we have, in this chapter, both the vision of Nebuchadnezzar and the interpretation. We've got all of the work, essentially, done for us. We don't even have to think outside the square. It's written right there. Thou art the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar and his empire was the head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Thus we find that the king with his empire the Neo-Babylonian Empire, represents this head of gold. And looking at Wikipedia, we find it's very uh, apt that gold is the metal used. The editors made this statement. The period of Neo-Babylonian rule thus saw unprecedented economic and population growth throughout Babylonia, as well as a renaissance of culture and artwork as Neo-Babylonian kings conducted massive building projects, especially in Babylon itself bringing back elements from the previous 2,000 years of Sumero-Akkadian culture. Truly, an empire of gold. However, much to Nebuchadnezzar's dismay, Daniel tells him that his empire would fall to another empire of silver, characterised by the chest of arms. We can see it on the statue over there. And if, we, if you go to Wikipedia, which I recommend if you ever want to study... Bible prophecy, it's the best tool. It has an excellent little description in the right-hand bar, and at the bottom of the right-hand bar, it has a tool called the succeeded by section. And it'll tell you, for example, who a king was succeeded by or preceded by. And in our case, it tells us which empire succeeded the Babylonians. The Archaemenid Empire of the Medes and the Persians defeated the Babylonians in 539 BC. The story is very famous. They in the middle of the night, diverted the course of a river, snuck through a gate and opened up the gates. The empire of the Babylonians that Nebuchadnezzar was so proud of was defeated. And the Achaemenid Persians rose to far greater heights than the Babylonians. And and they used silver as a currency, quite famously. They were the first during their period. Currency, coinage as we know it, was was first developed and used. And their strength and their size is very accurately portrayed by a chest and arms, you know, able to strike out and take a blow. However, the Archaemenid Empire wouldn't last forever. And now we get into our definitively prophetic section, because the Achaemenid Empire was succeeded by the Empire of Alexander the Great. His was the third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And if you know the story of Alexander the Great's empire, in 10 short years, he outstripped the Persian empire in size dramatically, marching his soldiers all the way from Macedonia and and even left a bit of Macedonia and Athens and Corinth, all the way to the Indus in Persia, an incredible empire. And his empire was characterised by brass. And if you've ever seen the iconic image of a Greek soldier, the hoplite, you'll know that they're characterised by that brass armour. Also what's interesting is that the empire of Alexander the Great is a belly and thighs. And that's interesting because it started out as a unified empire, but when Alexander the Great died, he was possibly assassinated, his many generals 
had a power struggle amongst themselves, and after a period of time, two generals rose up as the strongest. So we've got sort of like this one be <laughs> belly of Alexander the Great that stretches into the two thighs of his generals, which were called Seleucid and Ptolemy. They were all Syria and Egypt between them. However, Alexander's great empire is not the last either. His is replaced by an empire of iron. And this empire of iron is described as breaking in pieces and subduing all things. And if you know the empire that succeeded the Ptolemaic and Seleucid empire, it's the Romans. They entered the scene in typically Roman dramatic style and defeated the Greeks, no problem. Their empire ruled with the legions of iron. If you've read Asterix, you'll know the iconic legionary armed with his iron tools. And it covered much of the globe with its rule. However, as Daniel 2 tells us, the Roman Empire was by no means the last empire in the prophecy. The Roman Empire was replaced by a sort of almost Roman Empire, the feet of iron and clay. They've got elements of that Roman Empire left in it, but they've got none of the strength. The unified strength of iron is ruined by the mixing of the clay. And if you know any of the nations that succeeded the Romans, the Vandals and, and the Goths, they, they were able to conquer the Romans, but they weren't able to build an empire anywhere near to the standards of the Romans. And so we went into a period called the Dark Ages. And so we come to the end of Daniel 2, and we've got this very, very brief summary, which we could do a whole lecture on Daniel 2, and it'd be equally exciting. Of, but it's one of the linchpins of the prophecies of the Bible. Daniel, who we know predated Alexander the Great by some years, who claimed to write during the time of Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar, accurately predicts the rise and the fall of all of these empires that would succeed his own masters, to the point he was willing to go to his master, the king of Babylon, and say, your kingdom's going to end and it's going to be succeeded by a better one. And instead of being upset by this prophecy of doom of his own empire, the Babylonian king was so impressed that he rewarded him lavishly. There are, there are great details in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, which we can go into in a little bit more detail, which can give us great encouragement. If you look at the statue, it begins with a head of gold, and as we move down the statue, the metals progressively grow less valuable. And likewise, if you look at the political power of the various kings, they started out with the Babylonians, where their word was law and was succeeded by the Persians, who weren't able to change laws they'd previously implemented, which were followed by the Greeks, which came and went fairly quickly and sort of had control, which were followed by the Romans, which were backstabbing each other left and right, and you were lucky if you lasted a few years. The power of the empires grows less, but as the metals go down, they also grow stronger. You can't build a very good sword out of gold, but you can build an excellent one out of iron. And likewise, the Babylonians were, had an impressive army, but were nowhere near as impressive as the Persians, who were nowhere near as impressive as the Greeks, who weren't as impressive as the Romans. Yet, when we come to the feet, we find that the cycle breaks. All of a sudden, the strength of those metals is lost. Despite the intricacies of Daniel 2, though, it can still be argued, possibly, that it's a little vague. After all, if you were to make broad guesses like Nostradamus, you might well come up with similar prophecies about the nations that would succeed the Babylonians. They'll be stronger, they might be weaker politically. Yet, luckily for us, just around the corner, in Daniel chapter 7, is an even more persuasive prophecy. Daniel 7, verse 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision, so we know it's another prophecy, by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. We have another vision of Daniel. And to summarise what this, this prophecy is all about, it makes perfect sense, it fits perfectly if we take the beasts of this chapter to be the nations that would succeed the Babylonians, just like in chapter 2. 
Four great beasts come up from the sea, diverse one from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And, and we have here an excellent summary of the history of the Babylonian Empire. It started out as this underdog empire who forged their empire through their great prowess in battle. However, if we were to turn to Daniel chapter 6 or five, uh, wherever, Daniel chapter 5, we'd read about the end of the empire when it was lost in a fit of decadence. They had an opportunity where they were a great lion with eagle's wings, able to strike out quickly and powerfully, yet sooner or later, those wings were taken from them and they were given the heart of a man. And so, another beast succeeds them, like to a bear, and it raises itself up on one side. And this is fascinating, because if you know the history of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, you know it started out with two great cultures. There was the culture of the Medes and the culture of the Persians. And the Medes were the upper class, the ruling class, but the Persians were the historical fighters. They were the ones that were known for actually going out there and getting the job done. And for three years, the Medes ruled, but for the rest of the Achaemenid Empire, the Persians took over, defeated the Medes in a great battle, and succeeded them as rulers. Likewise, the bear raises itself up onto one side. It starts out on both sides and then it raises itself up as one side loses power and the other side takes control. And it has three ribs in the mouth of it and this makes sense because Persia had three great dominions. They had the dominion over modern day Turkey, over Egypt and over Persia, their homeland, the Syrian part around that. So we have this great description of the Persian Empire. And they said thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. And compared to the lion, it did. But after this, lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given unto it. This is the empire that succeeded the Persians, the Greek empire. The beast had four heads, four different kingdoms which would succeed Alexander the Great. I told you of two before in the two legs, but directly after Alexander's defeat, there were four. They very swiftly became two, as two of those empires weren't much up to scratch compared to the other two, but he was succeeded by four great generals. And it's given dominion. And the Greeks were given dominion. They were able to conquer armies from different cultures and different cl countries all across the known world. Far larger than themselves sometimes, they defeated three great armies of the Persians, which history tells us outnumbered them two to one at times. Finally, we come to the fourth beast. And we're not given a description as to what animal this is. So I haven't chosen a picture of it. Instead, I've just got a map. But this beast, which succeeds the third beast, is again our friend the Romans, which would defeat the Greek leopard and remove its various heads and would rule unopposed for a thousand years, led by its teeth of iron, which, where is that? It had great iron teeth in verse 7. So this beast is given iron teeth, the iron legions of Rome, to go out and to conquer all other nations. And if, if you are unsure with me whether or not this is really what this prophecy is saying, jump over to verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by an angel, and asked him the truth of all this, so he told me and made known the interpretations of these things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So we know that these prophecies, again, is another prophecy of the four great empires that would come one after the other. Remember, brothers and sisters and friends, that the book of Daniel predates Alexander the Great. And this is where it really gets exciting, because now we're going to look at a prophecy that goes into great detail 
about the life and works of Alexander the Great. Jump over the page with me to Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through to 8. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a feast appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw, that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw, and I, sorry, and behold, the, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. If this is beginning to sound slightly familiar and slightly recognisable, excellent. Now, it's worth noting that Daniel lived during the reign of two of the great empires that he wrote about. The empire of the Neo-Babylonians, and then he lived during the coup and the, and the siege and into the succeeding empire, the empire of the Achaemenid Persians. And Daniel receives this vision in chapter 8, and in verse 2, it tells us that in the vision, he's taken to Shushan the palace. Now, Babylon didn't have a Shushan the palace, but Persia most certainly did. So this tells us he, he's going into the future to the next empire along, the Persian Empire. And he wouldn't recognise this as Shushan the palace, obviously, till later on in life. Belshazzar, king of the, Nebu uh, of the Babylonians, Shushan the palace is in Persia. And in this, while he's near, you can see this palace, he's standing beside the river Ulai. And he receives a vision about these two great animals, symbolic like, like the previous chapter was symbolic, of the two great empires. The first animal, who's sitting by the banks of the capital city of Persia, was a ram, a great sheep. Clearly, this ram is symbolic of the Persian Empire, which makes sense as we read on, because like the bear in the previous chapter, the ram has a number of distinguishing features. Two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Now, remember that story of the different cultures in Persia, the Medes and the Persians. The Medes came up first. They were the great ruling class. They ruled as they saw fit and tended to oppress their Persian friends until the Persian friends realised that they were the stronger and took power and overtook the greatness of the Medes. Two horns, one starts out smaller but grows larger than the other. Likewise, there we've got these two main ruling classes. And, and during the first years of this empire, the empire didn't do much until along came the first king of the Persians who succeeded the last king of the Medes, a guy called Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. And Cyrus the Great and his son and grandson and especially great-grandson pushed westward and northward and southward and invaded modern-day Turkey, which was then Greek, and Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and Egypt. They, they basically invaded every single nation around them that they possibly could. And as the prophecy tells us, they were untouchable. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. He did according to his will and became great. But here comes the goat. 
Behold, an he-goat came from the west. Greece is west of Persia. On the face of the whole earth, this goat is undoubtedly Alexander's Greek empire. Greece forced all nations before it to choose between destruction or submission. And he conquered speedily. So quickly, in fact, that like the goat, he didn't touch the ground, essentially. In 10 years, he overtook the Persian Empire and the Egyptian Empire and moved all the way into defeating armies in India. That's how far he got. The Phoenicians, this great naval power he destroyed, we'll talk more about that in a second, all were destroyed. Lydia, all of these empires that came, lo and behold, to the help of the ram. There was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand at the end of verse 7. So nations come to help the ram, but fail. The ram is cast down by this goat. And in three great battles, we learn in history that Alexander the Great defeated the armies of the Persians. And the goat tramples the ram into the ground and, and wipes the ram out. And Alexander at the start was willing to offer terms to Darius and by the end of it, Darius had angered him such that the Persian Empire was destroyed and would not return until the time of the Romans. Then the goat waxes great and fills the earth, yet in its greatness, verse 8, when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And if that isn't symbolic of the Greek Empire, I don't know what is. At the very height of its power, the great man who had made it possible, Alexander the Great, is taken out of the scene. And from Alexander the Great rises up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. You've got these four generals that come up after Alexander the Great. Once again, these symbols, they repeat themselves. It's nothing new and it's incredibly detailed. Four generals that succeeded Alexander the Great. And if you're doubtful as to whether or not I'm just making all of this up, look at verses 20 to 21. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Definitive. And I'd remind you again, we proved these predated Alexander the Great's time. Possibly, though, it still lacks in a little bit of detail. It could still possibly be the product of good guesswork. Maybe the author of Daniel was just excellent at having a jolly good guess. If only we had a prophecy that went into even more detail, and maybe one that didn't come from Daniel. Well, turn with me to Ezekiel 26. And we're going to look at a prophecy that goes into excruciating detail about one specific incident in the life of Alexander the Great. Ezekiel 26. Son of man, this says in Ezekiel 26 and verse 2, because Tyrus hath said unto Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken that was the gates of the people, she is turned unto me, I shall be replenished, now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers, and I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil for nations." A little bit of background. Tyre is the capital city of the Phoenician Empire, which stretched all across the Mediterranean. Later on in life, they'd be known as the Carthaginians, which would have a problem with the next great empire, the Roman Empire. And they had great skill at sailing and an extremely large fleet. And this gave them great trading ability and control over the Mediterranean. And this was a problem for the various empires that had the rule over the, the Mediterranean, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek and the Roman empires. And chapter 26 tells of the downfall, the clash between these various empires and the city of Tyre. 
Now, Tyre had taken the opportunity of historic weakness in Israel to take spoil. The Isra Israelites had a, a time where they would have been defeated by the nations around about them. I think in this case it was the Assyrians in Israel and the Tyrians, who had historically been allies and friends of the Israelites back in the time of the first King David and his successor Solomon, second King David and his successor Solomon, now they'd taken the opportunity to, to march into Israel and to seize a lot of plunder. And God was going to punish them for that. As such, if we read in verse 7, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring up on Tyrus Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuchadrezzar is another name for Nebuchadnezzar. A king of kings from the north with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. He shall slay with the sword thy daughters in the field, and he shall make a fort against thee, and cast a mount against thee, and lift up the buckler against thee, and he shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with his axes he shall break down thy towers. By reason of the abundance of his horses, their dust shall cover thee. Thy walls shall shake at the noise of the horsemen, and of the wheels and of the chariots, when he shall enter into thy gates, as men enter into a city wherein is made a breach. With the hoofs of his horses shall he tread down all thy streets, he shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrisons shall go down to the ground. We reach the end of verse 11, and we have here a story. Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a navy. His, uh, his capital, Babylon, was miles from the sea. And, and as such, he saw the threat of Tyre as a great one. And so he came up against Tyre. And if you know anything about the history of Tyre, you'll know there's, there's two cities in Tyre. There's an island citadel that sits off the shore, and there's the mainland city of Tyre. And Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers were excellent at siege warfare, and after a siege that lasted only from 586 to 573 BC, they destroyed the city of Tyre, the mainland city of Tyre. And when the walls were breached, the Tyrian people, they panicked, got in their boats and sailed the distance offshore to their little citadel and sat there happily while Nebuchadnezzar got very upset because he didn't have a navy. He couldn't do anything about the people in the citadel. So Tyre survived to live another day. However, if you look at what's interesting about Ezekiel 26, look at the differences between verse 11 and 12. We start off and from verses 1 through to 11, we have this character Nebuchadnezzar who's described as he. He shall slay with the sword. He shall set engines against thee. But if you go into verse 12, the pronoun changes to they. They shall make a spoil of thy riches. And it seems like a small detail until you realise that Nebuchadnezzar only half finished the job. 200 years later, after the empire of the Medes and the Persians had been and gone, Along came Alexander the Great, and he had the same problem Nebuchadnezzar had. The Persians were able to build a navy. They were able to sort of meet the Tyrians head on. But Alexander the Great, he didn't have much of a navy. He was constantly a threat from the sea. And so he reaches the city of Tyre, and much like Nebuchadnezzar, he breaks down the main city on the mainland, and all of the people of Tyre flee to the island. But that's not the end of it this time. They shall make a spoil of thy riches and make a prey of thy merchandise. They shall break down thy walls again, destroy thy pleasant houses. Sounding familiar? And they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease and the sound of thy harps shall be no more heard. And I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more. For I, Yahweh, have spoken it, saith the Lord God. That doesn't seem like the story of a group of people sitting on a citadel happily, safely. And the story with Alexander the Great is different from Nebuchadnezzar. He was a much more tenacious man than Nebuchadnezzar. And the story goes something like this. The Alexander, at the, at the start, had sent, had sent a, a treaty delegation to the Tyrians and said, I just want to sacrifice in your citadel. And some people say this was a big trick, for them to open up the walls and he'd come marching into the island and take it. Who knows? All we know is that the Tyrians said no and killed his messengers. And that upset Alexander slightly. So he went to Tyre and tore down the city and, and killed all the people. And all of the people fled, who could, to the citadel offshore. 
And, and they stood there thinking they, they were safe. But Alexander the Great had the name Great for a good reason. He got his soldiers to tear down the old city on the mainland and to throw the rubbish into the sea. And, and slowly but surely, they built a causeway out to the island. And you can imagine sitting on the, on the walls of the island, watching that causeway come out. And we're told they built siege weapons on the causeway as it went out. And the Tyrians, they fought, fought back. They tried to defeat the siege weapons. Famously, they set ships on fire and rammed them up the causeway and set fire to the siege weapons. Alexander built more. And after a great siege, Alexander reached the island. And at that point, there was no surrendering. As verse 12 tells us, they lay their stones and their timber and their dust in the water. And then in verse 13, I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease and the sound of thy harps shall be no more heard. And I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more for I, Yahweh, have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And Tyre never did gain any of its power back. It, it lost that great power it once had. The, the, the remaining people fled to modern-day North Africa, which back then was known as Carthage, which would have a resurgence later on in life with the next empire, the Romans. But we can't talk about that this evening. The doom of Tyre was pronounced by Ezekiel years before it happened, with unerring detail. The city was laid waste first by Nebuchadnezzar, but only incompletely. And finally, it was destroyed entirely by Alexander and his men in a unique way, a way that you could not guess would happen. If you were to take an ordinary situation where a nation attacks an island nation, they might send ships, they might just, like Nebuchadnezzar, leave them alone, they might bargain with them. Who would have thought you'd break down the walls of the city, the houses of the city, and, and build a causeway out? And if you look at satellite maps, that causeway is still there. The island of Tyre is no longer an island. It's now an isthmus, a little peninsula sticking out. But this is all ancient history. And although it's quite interesting to learn about, it only comes into relevancy when we consider that all of this took place exactly as the Bible predicted. And don't forget, exactly as the Bible predicted years before they came to pass. These prophecies show that the prophecies of God in Daniel are true. And this has enormous implications, because if we've proved Daniel too true, then we need only turn to the end of the chapter, where we'll find an encouraging message left for those who would read it later on. Daniel 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Not like the kingdom of the Babylonians, or the Medes, or the Persians, or the Greeks, or the Romans, or the empires that succeeded the Romans, this kingdom would last forever. And what's more, it would fill the whole earth. This is the point of these prophetic messages. It's not so much about, oh, that's very interesting. It's to remind us that part of this has been fulfilled exactly as promised. Part of it is yet to come to pass. Now, if that part we can look at and say, that happened, then we can look to the future and say, that will happen with the same degree of accuracy. And so we, we have to come to the conclusion that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And that's what we're all about here with us Christadelphians. We want everyone to be a part of that kingdom. And that we have many other lectures, many other day evenings, many other Sundays on topics that go into great detail on the kingdom of God and what it will be like and how you can be a part of that. And if you want to talk to us afterwards, feel free to and we'll gladly discuss it with you. Thank you for listening.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at btf at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen. Thank you.